So that's it. I welcome you to another Tuesday teaching. This is Josephine, the digital professor of language Jews. And you know, Tuesdays like this, I teach a core course in my area of specialization, which is theology, philosophy of religion and theology. Fridays is when I discuss important German issues. I explore issues that are very essential as lessons of life, Fridays which are called Friday Tonic. Tuesday, I've been talking on arguments for God's existence. And I've taught on cosmological, classical cosmological arguments, teleological arguments, ontological arguments. There are other types of arguments that are varied from all the aforementioned arguments. And I'm going to do them in two parts. Today, I'm doing part one. And next Tuesday, I'm doing part two. And that will end all kinds of arguments I need to. If you need to know more, then you can reach out to me or contact me one way or the other. But that will be the end for arguments of for God's assistance. My description link, you find my email, my contact there where you can reach me or for one-to-one, -one, or if you have any comments, or sharing your thoughts on the, on the assistance of God. That's where you drop your comments, or you can send it to that, my email. Because on J July, by God's grace, I'm going to start on another interesting teaching. Very interesting. And... Uh, Honestly, it's one particular thing where we know that is so close to my heart. We get there, we get there. Because we cannot talk about any term, any concept in the Bible without it. Anyway, let's go ahead, let's join line with Joe's and then we start on today's teaching. I welcome you back. So I was just telling you that the part one I'm bringing you today about other arguments for the sense of God, part two will be next Tuesday, and that will end it all. And by July, I'm starting on another topic, another topic, another teaching entirely, systematic theology. Because it's only in systematic theology you could so the Bible says this. This is what the scriptures say. Because when you take a particular term or concept, like maybe you're talking about prayer, or you're talking about something, then you need to do a kind of synthesis or analysis from the book of, from Genesis to Revelation. And collate to be able to say, this is what the Bible says about this particular concept or about this particular thing. So I'll be doing systematic theology from July. And usually, you know, the policy here is to you follow me with my prepared PowerPoint slides. I need to do that for those who I'm teaching. So take your pen and take your paper. And as I present to you, you can follow me as I teach. Today is going, it's going to be a very short teaching today. Let me start with contemporary modern version of the ontological argument by Alvin Platinga. Alvin Platinga, born 1932, first reviews and rejects Gonilo's objections to Anselm's ontological argument. Gonilo's argument will work only with properties that have an intrinsic, intrinsic maximum, but the unsurpassable properties of Gonilo's island have no intrinsic maximum. There could always be a greater. He then proceeds to evaluate several versions of the ontological argument before developing his own version. According to Platinger, 
it is possible that some being has maximum greatness. However, if a being has this property, then it has it in every possible world. So, reasons Platinga, if it is possible that God exists with this property, it is necessary that God exists. However, in the end, Platinga remains skeptical of the ontological argument, for it requires that one accept the premise that a being with maximal greatness is possible. Overview of the teleological arguments. I mean, in the previous videos, I've atomized and explained to you about teleological arguments. This argument focuses on characteristics of the cosmos that seem to reflect the design or intentionality of God, or more modestly, of one or more powerful, intelligent, God-like agents. Parallel arguments may be formulated as providing evidence that the cosmos is the sort of reality that will be produced by an intelligent being, and then argue that positing this source is more reasonable than agnosticism or denying it. As in the case of the cosmological argument, the defender of the teleological argument may want to claim only to be giving us some reason for thinking there is a God. Note, the way the various arguments might then be brought to bear on each other. If successful, the teleological argument may provide some reason thinking, I mean, so teleological argument may provide some reason for thinking that the first cause of the cosmological argument is purposeful. Why the ontological argument provides some reason for thinking that it makes sense to posit a being that has divine attributes and necessarily exists. Beyond all of them, an argument from religious experience may provide some initial reasons to seek further support for a religious conception of the cosmos and to question the adequacy of naturalism. One version of the teleological argument will depend on the intelligibility or purposeful explanation. In our own human case, it appears that intentional, purposeful explanations are legitimate and can truly account for the nature and occurrence of events. In thinking about an explanation of, for the ultimate character of the cosmos, is it more likely for the cosmos to be accounted in terms of a powerful, intelligent agent or in terms of a naturalistic scheme of final laws with no intelligence behind them? Which is which? Taste. Employing the teleological argument, we draw attention to the order and stability of the cosmos the emergence of vegetative and animal life, the existence of consciousness, morality, rational agents, and the like. In an effort to identify what might possibly be seen as purposely explicable features of the cosmos. Naturalistic explanations, whether in biology or physics, are then cast as being comparatively local in application, where end up against the broader schema of a theistic metaphysis. Darwin, Darwinian accounts of biological evolution, will not necessarily assist us in thinking through why there are either any such laws or any organisms to begin with. Arguments. Supporting and opposing the teleological argument will then resemble arguments about the cosmological argument. You remember the cosmological argument? With the negative side, containing that there's no need to move beyond the naturalistic account. 
and the positive side aiming to establish that failing to go beyond naturalism is unreasonable. In assessing the theological argument, we can begin now with the objection from uniqueness. We cannot compare our cosmos with others to determine which have been designed and which have not. If we could, then we might be able to find support for the argument. If we could compare our cosmos with those who knew to be designed, and if the comparison were closer than with those we knew not to be designed, then the argument might be plausible. Hi, I hope you're following what I'm saying. Without such comparison, however, that argument fails. Reply to this line of attack, I've contended that were we to insist that inferences in unique cases were out of order, supposing, then we would have to rule out otherwise perfectly respectable scientific accounts of the origin of the cosmos. Besides, while it is not possible to compare the layout of different cosmic histories, it is in principle possible to envisage walls that seem chaotic, random, or based on laws that cripple the margins of life. Now we can envisage an intelligent being creating such worlds, but through considering their features, we can articulate some marks of purposive design to help us judge whether the cosmos was designed rather than created at random. Some critics appeal to the possibility that the cosmos has an infinite way to bolster and reintroduce the uniqueness objection. Given infinite time and chance, it seems likely that something like a world will come into existence with all its appearance of design. If so, why should we take it to be so shocking that a world has its apparent design? And why should explaining the world require for city one or more intelligent designers. Replies replete the earlier move of insisting that if the objection were to be decisive, that many, then many seemingly respectable accounts will also have to fall by the wayside. It is often often considered that the theological argument does not demonstrate that one or more designers are required. It seeks rather to establish that positing such purposeful intelligence is reasonable and preferable to naturalism. Recent defenders of the argument this century include George Slithinger, Robin Collins, Richard Swayburn. It is rejected by J.L. Mackey, Michael Martin, Nicholas Everett, and others. One feature of the teleological argument currently receiving increased attention focuses on epistemology. It has been contended that if we do rely on our cognitive faculties, it is reasonable to believe that naturalistic forces that are entirely, that is those forces that are entirely driven by chance or are the outcome of processes not formed by an overriding intelligence do not bring this about. An illustration may help to understand the argument. Imagine coming across what appears to be a sign reporting some information about your current altitude like some rocks in the configuration, giving you your current location and precise height above sea levels in mirrors. If you had reason to believe that this sign was totally the result 
of chance configurations. I mean, you know what I'm saying? That okay, all the resign, we have been giving your altitude, all those the design they're giving to you, you believe they are totally the result of chance, just chance configurations. Will you still be reasonable to trust in such some things again that it will not be reasonable? And that trusting our cognitive faculties requires us to accept that they were formed by overarching good creative agents, which they call God. So this rekindles the sketchy's point about relying on the goodness of God to ensure that our cognitive faculties are in good working order. Objection to this argument center on naturalistic explanations, especially those friendly to evolution. In evolutionary epistemology, one tries to account for the reliability of cognitive faculties in terms of trial and error leading to survival. I'm going to stop here today, really stop here today, because looking and then listening, reading to all these kind of arguments, you need to ponder, you need to truly wonder, what do you believe as an individual? What do you believe? There's no argument that can change my mind that God exists, a supreme being who created everything. But what about you? What do you believe? What do you think? That's the point. I'm going to end this in part two next Tuesday. And I leave the pondering to you all. But you want to share your thoughts? Please be free to share your thoughts of what you believe in the existence of God in the comment section, my description link of this video. And do not forget, please, to strike that button, like button, subscribe button, notification button, so that anytime I release any other video can be notified. Have a blessed week.